second panel, I think the first one was an introduction for many of you young people to get a grasp of uh, what you can do in policy as a career. So it's more of a career option to introduce you to the different possibilities that exist in changing the world. All of us, when we are 18 to, in the age group of 18 to 40, want to change the world. And after 40, we've already changed the world, or changed ourselves. So this, are, this is an introduction for you to try and learn a little bit more about this career as an option, what you need to do, how to get there. You're free to talk to these people after the uh, panels as well. But now I'll invite the second panel, uh, which is uh, uh, people, I think, generally above the age of 35 in this panel, uh, to talk about, you know, what is the real impact of policy making in our politics? Because uh, policy is executed through politics in a democratic society. So what, you know, we, we are used to criticizing politics a lot, but, you know, we'll try to use this panel to be, get a more sophisticated understanding. Can I invite uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Vinay Sahasubuddhe? So the Vice President of the Bharatiya Janata Party and heads the policy cell uh, from the party. Uh, Mr. Narayan Ramachandran, my colleague uh, at Takshashila. Uh, Madhavan, who heads a very interesting uh, uh, think tank in Delhi called the uh, PRS Legislative Research. He'll probably tell you more about it. And Manjit Kripalani, uh, the wonderful lady from Bombay who heads Gateway House. She adds glamour to our panel. Thanks, good for brains. And uh, me. Right? So, the, what I said when we started this panel is, I told them, look, we are not going to, we are not going to have any preparation. We're just going to do this entirely extempore. Uh, try and engage uh, uh, members of the audience as much as possible. So, what I do is, uh, yeah, the introductions, etc. You can read the brochures. The introductions are all there. Detailed introductions. We are all very accomplished people, so reading it out will fill one whole hour of our time. We'll just do this. Uh, let's start by throwing this uh, uh, house open to you, and maybe we'll have three or four questions on what, uh, when you think about policy and politics, and the connection between policy and politics, what are the questions or thoughts that come into your mind? And I'll ask each of them to respond. I think that's a much better way to start with. We'll, we'll start with you first. You just raise your hands. Just do it. How does policy translate into politics? How does policy translate into politics? That's one. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, I mean, one common thing we hear in India is that ideas are dying or doesn't, but what actually happens? Why don't they never translate into action? Right. Why don't they? Yeah. Policy mistakes often lead to political defeat, right? So, how do you accept your mistakes and how does it translate into future policies? Right. We'll take one more question. The person in the white shirt, I think, has a question. You? No. Make a question. Yeah, make a question. Yeah, make a question. Yeah, it's not so much a question as a uh, uh, provoking comment, but uh, vote by politics. And how does that interfere with policy? With policy. Fine. We have a good set of uh, questions. I'll maybe. Uh, Ask Narayan to start off, okay. right? And I just go in there. Yeah, you can ask sure. me questions if you want to. Just feel free to budget sure. with me. Right? Just to show that I am con conversant with politics, I am going to do a Muraji Desai and ask a question to answer all the questions that have been raised. So, if I could ask the young people here, how many of you think you are relatively free to do what you choose. So this this question you cannot silence is not an acceptable answer. So you have to actually so you can raise your hands and say very free, not at all free, somewhat free. Three three choices. So please and and only young people. Only young people. <laughs> that includes you. I, I what is young anyway? Okay, we'll start with the white shirts in front. Uh, <laughs> you are absolutely free, okay? Any, come on, I go with the white shirt at the back. I'm sorry, we have to identify by color because that's the only, you know, as, as, as Nitin said, age is on the wrong side of us here. And at this distance, I can only see a little bit of color, and even that will go in about 10 years. So, somewhat, somewhat free. Somewhat free, okay? 
Tem do guardar? You like to do everything, but are you free? Do you think you are free? Fully free, somewhat free in between? <laughs> somewhat. Somewhat free, okay. Can I ask another question? Sure. Uh, and maybe one more, and then I'll ask the question. One more uh, input uh, from the back. Uh, everybody's wearing pink that I can see from here. So, the pink, uh, the pink uh, lady behind the white shirt. Sorry, you're in direct line of sight. <coughs> free, somewhat free, not at all free. Somewhat free. So interesting that uh, the gentleman with age on his side said fully free, and all of you are saying somewhat. Anybody, any, you want to tell me what? What is that aspect of somewhat that is not totally free? So give me a give me a for instance. What prevents you from being totally free? And I have a point to this, so I'll give it in a minute, but... Okay, why don't why, why did you think about it? I, you know, I... So the, the question on the panel is, can our politics do good policy? The, the, the thing I want to leave with all of you is the fact that many of us are at least saying we are free. You know, two nations were born at the same time roughly 70 years ago. And I don't think you will get answers that even suggest that they are somewhat free in the other nation. So, our nation can certainly do reasonably good policy, right? So the more difficult question is, can we do great policy? So the very fact that you're free, the very fact that you can come here, you can speak your mind, you can lead when you choose, that, that amount of freedom to choose your politician, to choose roughly your own life, uh, is, is a great sense of, uh, of our politics at least doing some ability to uh, uh, our politics being able to do some amount of policy that influences all of that. So, I'll start by saying, for sure, our politics can do good policy. There's some debate about whether it can do great policy. Obviously, the, the words itself have to be clarified. I'll ask uh, Dr. Sahasra Mudde to respond because the, that, that is the political scene because he occupies a very interesting space. He heads a public policy think tank within the BJP. Right? And uh, and now, not only is it, it's a public policy think tank within a political party, it's a political party in government. So, how do you see that happening? You know, ideas coming from your organization or from outside, adopted by politicians and then getting into government. I think basically the story starts with a sense of purpose. I mean, why are we in politics? This is the key question which every politician needs to ask himself or herself. And if there is a very definitive answer to that, then that would certainly shape your policies and eventually your politics. Because of this uh, very acute deficit of purpose in politics, I think all other things have followed thereafter. If I don't have a purpose, apart from occupying a position or getting elected, becoming an MLA or MP or a minister, it has to be something much more than that. Once you lose that, I think uh, all other accidents are bound to happen. And uh, they don't remain an accident. In fact, it is, it is very logical for that matter that if there is no sense of purpose, uh, there is a complete policy holiday and your politics becomes bereft of uh, everything for that matter. It becomes just an electoral competition, nothing more than that. But now, uh, specific to our current circumstance, right? Now, uh, we we do. I mean, we do have a government which has been elected on the basis of promises they've made in terms of delivering on implementation, being uh, uh, being proactive and all that. Those those promises have gotten them into power you know, in a very unprecedented way. Now, in this setup, do you think there is a space for ideas, policy ideas in the in the government? Yeah, of course, because uh, in a situation like this, I mean, I'm not going to be partisan in referring to this, but. There is a whole lot of aspiration that we are seeing all around. And people are wanting something. People are yearning for a change, which is why we had uh, such a massive mandate and we had a, after 30 years, one single party getting majority in, in the Lok Sabha. So there is a message out of that and people are wanting that change. And there is a promise for, uh, I mean, promise about that change, which the Prime Minister uh, uh, had, had been talking about during the campaign and of course the uh, our party and all his colleagues as well. 
so now we will have to deliver and by delivering we will necessarily have to come out come out with uh, uh, policies programs and our politics need to be evolving around that it cannot be other way around politics cannot get prominence in a situation of this kind it has to be policies essentially and i'm happy that the prime minister has always been saying about uh, what he calls that policy driven governance and therefore i believe policies because the nation has been taken into a particular direction maybe many of you might have heard that on the 18th of may after a couple of days after the election results were announced the guardian of london in an editorial comment said that perhaps finally it is now that the britishers have left india if what he means is that we have to now transform india and take it i mean this is what mr modi had promised and if he has to deliver he has to have a complete break up from the way the government the the, the nation was run all along and you have to now take it in a different way which is certainly not continuing with the policies adopted by the britishers which anyway i mean there were many gandhians also who used to say right uh, at the beginning maybe within 10 years of the independence that while uh, the white britishers have gone the black britishers continue to be ruling so i mean i'm not going to going into that debate point is we have to show change and the change necessarily starts from policies distinctive policies different policies and they naturally have to be translated into programs and that should be at the core of our politics that is what i mean madhav you know you prs you we were having a discussion yesterday where you told me that out of uh, 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 545 plus 200 uh, 300 uh, mps in the last lok sabha more than half of them had read the briefs produced by his organization so prs does a very interesting contribution to indian democracy in the sense that it allow it analyzes the bills presented uh, tabled in parliament every single bill they analyze it in a very neutral fashion give the pros and the cons and give it to the politicians and more than half of the last lok sabha were his uh, people who are reading his bills directly so but now how many of them actually use it i mean that's the question right they, they might listen to you patiently because you give them free coffee and biscuits right? Wait, i don't i don't, <laughs> I don't. Uh, because typically the meetings happen when they call us and i have their coffee and biscuits oh, so you can... okay so so it's uh, other way around. it's the other way around. Uh, so just before that let me just ask a uh, follow narayan and ask a few leading questions i will end up leading this by last leading questions and First question: How many of how many people in this room are below the age of 25? Can you raise your hands? It's an easy yes or no. Right? Okay. How many of you are below the age of 25? Okay. 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 so uh, i'm just i'm just asking her huh? how many of you think it is important for people to exercise your vote i mean if you are raising your hands please raise them like this and not like this so that i can see okay uh, I, the message is we should give tea and biscuits but that's yeah. <laughs> yeah okay why okay now comes a difficult question any one of you why do you think it's important and i'm trying to link it back to the topic before i answer this question why do you think it's important any one at all okay let me ask you one more second ah that's number the lady with the backpack is going to raise their hand for yeah please yeah, please i think every vote counts okay I think every vote counts in a democracy, and that's what we've been told, and that's what I believe, and I'll keep on believing. So, so yeah. what does that give you the power to? That gives us the power to to choose who we want at the top. You know, every okay. one of us. Okay. So. Great, great answer. Uh, now, one more question. Uh, just a bit of history. Most of Asia and Africa was under colonial powers until the 40s, until World War II. India was one of the first to get independent, and by 1960, every other country, most of Asia and Africa became independent. Can you name? Can anyone name two countries? I'm asking you two, which have had held elections at the 
scheduled time every time and if the person who was in government lost the election peacefully handed over power and did not call in the army like what happened in Pakistan in 71 right they called in the army and did like Sheikh Mujib take over so can you name two countries I mean I can name one India can you name the second can you name a second country in Asia and Africa, 1950s to 2014? Elections have been held on schedule. Incumbent, when the incumbent loses election, hands over power to Israel. Sana? Kenya? South Africa? I mean, that, no. Uh, South Africa is much more recent. I mean, for 50 years. Let's say, let, let's put a minimum limit of 50 years of liberty. Singapore has not had free and fair elections which are handed over power. You can go, you, it's compulsory to go and vote, provided you vote for a particular party. I mean, so, I won't go. Okay, the answer is, I don't know of a second one. Okay, so the reason I'm bringing this back is, the point that you said is important to vote, and in a way, let me reinterpret what you said. It gives you the power to throw out the current government. That is a very, very strong power that all of us have. Which, in China, they don't have. In dictatorships, they don't have. Okay, that's, the, that's the real power that we have. And that is what converts good politics, connects good politics and good policy. Because if you don't make good policy, how are you defining it? And I would define good policy as something that gives you the outcomes that people want. Whatever that may be. If you don't deliver, then they throw you out. <coughs> And therefore, that connects politics to policy. So if Mr. Modi, who has raised aspirations, if he delivers in the next five years, he will win the re-election. If he doesn't, he'll probably get thrown out. And he knows that. And everybody <coughs> knows that. And that would put back the pressure on him and his government to deliver. And therefore, develop good policies. But that's how many of them that's actually good. listen to what you So, why do they call you? That's the big question, right? Nobody, they don't get any uh, brownie points in the party. Yeah. They don't get any promotions based on that. Nobody votes for an MP because he has, let us say, thought through a right to education bill <coughs> and made a contribution in parliament because that rarely comes out in the public domain. I think most of them are doing it because, as Mr. Sarasrabhude said, they are there with a sense of purpose. Most politicians, and I have interacted with a large number of them, have a, I mean, we are all cynical about politicians, but many of them, when they came in at least, came in with a sense of purpose and idealism. And there is, with all the corruption and all the cynicism and all the other dirty things going around, there is a core of that lying around. I'll just give you an example. We had a session last year, I remember the date, December 19th, <coughs> Delhi, and you can, you, if you're familiar with Delhi winters, you know how cold that gets. 9 a.m., Professor Abhijit Banerjee of MIT coming in and we had organized this and speaking about how do you measure, how do you check whether uh, policy, uh, whether various schemes are working or not, how do you measure that? This is an academic professor of MIT coming and speaking. We have sent out invitations to all MPs. More than 20 of them turn up on a cold winter morning to understand. They are not going to get any benefit out of that other than knowledge, but they do turn up. So I don't know why they do, but the way we are looking at it is Parliament <coughs> legislatures are a very key and integral part of policy making and in the last session I noticed when people asked, people said okay, citizens, government, nobody talked about legislators as being core to policy making and I think that is critical in a democracy and what we are trying to do is to enable the individual legislature, legislator to question issues, to be more active and therefore be a better policy maker. I mean, and they seem to be interested, that's why we still exist. Okay. Now, th you see, there's this conception in, uh, in, in general that policy making is something which is done in Delhi. Right? There is this Delhi mindset. And what we've seen in the last few years is a refreshing change where <clears throat> the locus, the domain of policy making has moved from out of Delhi into other parts of the country. And when you go to the other parts of the country, it's not necessarily that they're talking about local issues alone. So when you're, for example, in Bangalore, there are a lot of think tanks talking about Bangalore and urban issues, right? Those are local issues. In Goa, you have a very healthy culture of village panchayats, which are grassroots policy making. I mean, if the rest of India can have the kind of panchayats that you do, I think it will be a much better place. But 
there are also organizations thinking about national and global issues outside Delhi. And Manjit heads one of them called Gateway House. She's a co-founder of Gateway House. She's based in, well, no prizes for guessing. Gateway House is based next to Gateway of India and Bombay. And they, they are a council of world affairs, global affairs. And I'm going to ask Manjit, who's a co-traveler, because Takshila is based in Bangalore, even further away from Delhi. Right? I'm going to ask Manjit as a co-traveler, what were the experiences of being in Bombay? Is, is Bombay a place where you can talk to people about national and international issues? Are people interested or are they just interested in what time does the metro, uh, what's your local train run and stations and all? Uh, thank you, Nitin. Uh, thank you all for being here. Lovely to have this young group of students here. Uh, Bombay, absolutely. Actually, before Gateway House was set up, we didn't really have any policy institutes at all in Bombay. And most people in Bombay think about business. So our job was to start creating a public debate. At least get the public to start thinking about the government. People think about business, but they don't think about government. And unless now it has started to become so... Uh, non-functional, that people are now compelled to think about policy and business is compelled to think about policy. So it has made a very big difference because what we do is we try and drag the big fish and the small fish. So we have the big fish as business to get them to come and become members of Gateway House so they have a vested interest and are forced to think about policy issues. And uh, with young students we have things like essay competitions, we have young members group who can uh, we do little trips for them, they travel to foreign policy hotspots so they can learn and be the future foreign policy makers of India. Why Mumbai? Mumbai is really uh, the international face of India, it's India's face to the world. And in some sense, more than Bangalore and even recently Delhi, uh, no, it's a no, different, it's a different face. Bad things about Bangalore. <laughs> because Bombay is at this matrix of uh, everything that matters internationally, it's uh, terrorism, it's inequality, it's urbanization, it's business, uh, it's, uh, Bollywood. it's Bollywood, the media, it's, uh, yes, it's IT, yeah, it's IT, and it's on the water. It's our, uh, our external engagement with the world took place from the port of Mumbai, or Bombay. And those of you who may not know because you're all born, you're all liberalization children here, born after 1991, but uh, until 1951, <laughs> no, not, not Front of the, not the front of the road, the back of the road. Until 1951, and this is a quiz question you should all ask yourself. Uh, the Indian rupee was legal tender in uh, West Asia, which is in the Arab countries. And uh, until the British were in India, which is 1947, which is not so long ago, the British government's Middle East policy, the entire policy of all of the Arab states was conducted out of Mumbai. It was Mumbai presidency. We still have those remnants here. And there are plans for making a Bombay an international financial center. You can't really do it unless you have a functional city. And unless you understand how the rest of the world works. The rest of the world is sitting in India. Uh, it is trying very hard to influence India. What are we doing to influence the world? We used to do it in the old days. What are we doing to influence the world? That's really what uh, India has been. I think uh, she mentioned something about business, right? And uh, I think this was sort of this is some of uh, Dilip's uh, early question. See, I think there's been a very interesting shift in the way businesses are engaged in uh, policy making or interest, the interest business has taken in, uh, in uh, policy making governance. Now, if you were in the 70s and you were a businessman in, a rich businessman in Mumbai or Bombay at that time, your only relationship with the government was as a supplicant, right? You go to the government and beg for licenses and the government gives you 501 license to produce scooters and mixies and blenders and so forth. Right? And of course you would finance political parties and all that. But generally the, uh, the, the open relationship or the public relationship between the businessman and the government was as a supplicant. Then in 1991 we had these partial reforms under uh, Narasimha Rao and uh, Manmohan Singh. And what these uh, partial reforms created was some sectors were liberalized to some extent, some extent, some other sectors were not liberalized to some extent. So there were loopholes. The possibility of loopholes came into being. So you would have had very weird, if you read the, how many of you actually follow the uh, uh, finance minister's budget speech? If you don't, I really recommend that you do. Because in the speech, you'll have something to the effect that 
tariff duty on <coughs> rubber tires with sulfur content between 12.5% to 13% is 25%. Tariff duty is between uh, on uh, rubber tires with sulfur content of 15% and more is something else. Right? And all these fine grained uh, statements about rubber tires made in the Lok Sabha, right? it's very weird. And you understand, you have to ask why this is happening because there is a political constituency which wants to create a loophole yes. in, the, in the system of laws and regulations so that you can go through. So you are a businessman, you want to go through the loophole, but the loophole should be shaped such that only you can go and none of your competitors can go. Right? So they used to spend a lot of time creating me sized loopholes in the system in the last 20 years in the post-liberalization uh, uh, era. Now what happened in the last 5-6 years, uh, and I would use Neera Nadia as a sort of a uh, metaphor for this, was a lot of things came together. Uh, there was urbanization, a lot of middle class, global competition, most importantly RTI and social media. Now all these things came together and said, look, you can't survive with that me-sized loophole as a businessman anymore. Right? The chances of you being found out uh, being dragged, your your, uh, your your backroom operation being dragged into the public and not only that, whatever benefits which you might uh, have gotten from these uh, methods will be taken back. The Supreme Court will say oh, all you know, licenses are taken back. So the, the way the government, uh, the, the businessman looks at politics and policy has changed because now there is an increasing need, not all businessmen, right? there are lots of businessmen in sectors which are still dark to the external world. But increasing number of businesses are realizing that they have to engage in an open, professional, transparent basis with government and other public stakeholders. That means uh, the, the kind of engagement they'll have to do is different. You can't say that, look, I have this guy in Delhi, I'll just pay him some money and he'll fix the problem for me. Right? That's not going to work. That's increasingly less likely to work in the And one more thing, you all know this, Indian business is now increasingly global. Uh, in the last 10 years, because the government has been sort of non-functional, Indian business has simply taken its business abroad because they find it easier to do, the returns are small. Uh, so in some sense, uh, for many years, maybe for two or three decades, Indian business has been leading diplomacy in India. But they don't leverage it. They don't leverage it with government and the government doesn't leverage them at all. So we as a think tank are attempting to, to bring these two together and understand how they can work together to help India achieve its strategic interest. Yeah. And, and the reason I mention business is because, like it or not, businessmen are a very important driver of policy making. Right? Uh, we, we might say this is undemocratic, we have votes, but businessmen, businessmen are important uh, stakeholders in the system and therefore they have a sort of a, a undue influence in what policies get made. So to the extent that businessmen are forced to make transparent, professional, above board uh, engagements with the government, it's good for democracy as a well. whole. That's, that's the part. Uh, now, one question. How many of you know the name of your local municipal councillor or village panchayat person? How many of you know the name of your uh, prime minister? <laughs> how many of you know? No, no, no. I just saw only a handful of... How many of you the name, know the name of your prime minister? Good. How many of you know the name of your uh, local MP? MP? Yeah, see, I think there's a disproportionate number of people who know people about national politics. But which is the kind of government which interfaces with you most? Local. Your drains are fixed by, not by Prime Minister Modi, not by your MP, but by your Panchayat Chief, right, or your Municipal Council. PWD. PWD, which is under the Municipal Corporation. So there is a lot of this. Uh, policy making and politics which happens at the municipal level which affects us. But somehow as citizens we are oblivious to this, right? We do complain. We say that, you know, some so and so is a crook, so and so is not doing his job. But the real action is at the municipal level. So maybe uh, I just want to talk to Narayan about uh, Beaklip, uh, the Bangalore uh, uh, intervention in fixing municipal level things. And just give the audience a sense of how it's bringing politics and policy together and the kind of change it's attempting. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so Nitin is referring to a program called uh, B-Clip, which uh, is, is, is being run in Bangalore. And, and what we do there is we, we train would-be corporators in 
all that they require to become corporators and, and become corporators in a much more informed way than just showing up to become a corporator. Uh, as important as the training itself is sort of the selection process, so we invited applications from several hundred people and through the process of interviews which were conducted by not just ourselves but a whole host of uh, citizens who, who cared about the city, uh, we identified the two batches of 50 that went through the, through the program. And through the interview process, we basically identified people who, who really showed their passion in terms of wanting to help with changing, changing the city. Uh, after they were selected, uh, they had programs, everything from economic reasoning, which by the way is a bit important in this whole thing, all the way to you know, how you might actually conduct a project, a project of your choice. So for instance, if you're going to change uh, garbage in your ward, or uh, if you wanted to create a parking structure in your ward, whatever it is that each little group of three or four people chose, how might you go about thinking about it so that uh, so that you know you could actually do it in a rigorous, analytical, and yet politically savvy way? The political part of it we introduced that on, only those who could bring hundred signatures from their ward could actually be admitted to the program. So it's sort of an introduction to the idea that you can't be an armchair politician, no matter how well you articulate or no matter how much you care you actually have to bring people along with you. And the idea was to say, go get 100 signatures at least, so that you, 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 you begin the process of, uh, of political discovery for yourself. And the program's been you know, fantastic, I think, both from our point of view and from the point of view of, of, of the 100 candidates. We might do it yet again. But of course, the little curveball in all of this is that the, the municipal elections are very likely to be postponed for a very political economy kind of reason which is that uh, the BJP wants to hang on to power in Bangalore and they find that the easiest way to do it is to simply delay the election. So we have a classic case of India happening where you have this new program where you're training a whole bunch of people but you also have the old thing that you can sort of fix a few uh, laws for instance and therefore stay in power for a little bit longer. Yeah. On the same note, um, uh, you, uh, uh, Madhu, you have the Lamb Fellowship. Right? Uh, what I just want to give you a preamble. The Lamb Fellowship is where they take people like you, some of the younger people at the back, I think 25 is the age limit. People below the age of 25, they'll train you and then they'll put you as an assistant to an MP. It's called a legislative uh, assistant. assistant to a member of parliament program. right? And that's been running for about two years now. Uh, we've met some of the people, very, very interesting people, very dynamic people who become le legislative assistants. Uh, do you think that as a model of intervention, first just explain a little bit more about that to them. Then do you think as a model of intervention that's making sense to the system? Okay, it's the fourth batch now, by the way. So, the idea was very simple. It is that unfortunately in our country, most people like us don't get into politics. And our kids don't get into politics. So politics had become a closed shop of mostly people whose parents were senior politicians. And a few guys who had puzzle power. So, we thought, okay, if this is going on, I mean, this doesn't really look good for the country 20 years, 30 years from now. So, can we at least open opportunities for young people to engage with the political system, not necessarily become a politician, but at least engage, get some exposure? Because how do you, most of us, how, do you, how can you get an exposure to the policy making system? You either write an IAS exam, in which case you are committing the next 35 years of your life or you don't get engaged. So we said, can we have some way by which they connect, work with the policy makers, politicians for a while and then do whatever they want to do in life. But this will give them the exposure to engage like long. That was a core idea. How has it worked? So we, so there's a selection process. Last year we got 1100 applications. We select about 50. Uh, we have 46 in this batch. Each of them is placed with an MP. And work. So we train them for a month, then they are placed as an MP. They work as the MP's legislative assistant, and we of course have a weekly review in uh, various training modules in the interview, etc. What has happened with them in the past? So there have been 98 of them in the previous three batches put together. Out of that, roughly speaking, 
25 to 30 of them are somewhere in the policy polit politics area. What do I mean by that? Some of them are working for other MPs or continuing to work, work with the same MPs. Some of them have worked, joined political parties. In fact, interestingly enough, this election, the general election, there were land fellows with the Congress back office, there were land fellows working with Mr. Modi's campaign, and there were land fellows working for Amadi party. So we have in that sense, they have been working across, depending upon whatever they wanted. So there is about 25% in that sense, retention in the political policy making space. That's what we are saying. Dr. Sahasrabhadeh, you have young people again, right, in the public policy uh, cell. What has been, what are the kind of people you get and what do you do with them? And what's the impact they create? Well, these are people basically who want to influence the decision making within the political parties and people in the government. And therefore, uh, they have some research background, they are uh, wanting to make some change and therefore they would like to work in a particular arena and basically since we are working in uh, close tandem with the BJP uh, naturally we are interested in uh, bringing out some studies with pertaining to the gaps and convergence in the BJP policies across the states or over a period of time uh, which will give us an insight into uh, whether we have changed and if we have changed for better or what kind of factors that influence our change into the policy issues, our approaches into the policy issues. So that kind of uh, projects we are continuing with. Uh, but one important factor which I believe uh, this discussion need to focus upon as well is that, uh, I mean the moot question as you had raised it or what is the title, whether uh, polit good politics can or politics can really make good policy. There are two important factors which uh, we are missing so far. What is the electoral system in which we operate? And secondly, as a maybe a byproduct of that, but the approach of the people towards politics at large and elections in particular. I'll explain. Basically, what has happened, and there have been uh, umpteen number of references to this by various politicians, including <coughs> Mr. L. K. Advani, that the nation finds itself, and especially the government of the day, in a perennial election mode. Because every time there is one election or the other around the corner, and therefore all your decision making, in a way, gets influenced by the electoral impact of your decisions. And then you are wary of taking decisions which are apparently not very popular decisions. And that has uh, very severely impacted and uh, negatively more so, uh, on our economy and on our various uh, uh, policy areas as well. This is very important which we need to uh, look into. Secondly, the electoral system is also very fragmentationist. The first past the post system is a very fragmentationist elect electoral system and there are several countries world over who are switching over from the first past the post uh, to the other uh, alternatives that are available. And I believe this fragmentationism which is at the core of this system also has impacted upon some kind of uh, identity politics. This is, I mean the 2014 election was perhaps after a uh, considerably large period of time when uh, so many, after so many years that identity issues were pushed to the periphery and development became an agenda. But this may not happen over the, I mean time and again, I mean identity issues if we do not want them to be influencing the mindset, the minds of the people, the thinking of the people, then I think it is time we also have evolved some narrative around how do we go in for a different electoral system. Thirdly, when I say the mindset of the people, there was, I mean not very long ago, and I only pray to the God that it doesn't visit us again, which is the cynicism, which was all around, I mean few months before. And therefore, people used to say that uh, if everything is going to make money out of politics, what prevents me from doing that? And therefore, even voters, and I am giving you the example, I am happy there were examples given about the municipal uh, elections. In, in Thani, where I come from, or in Mumbai, or in Shodapur, in Maharashtra, I know for certain that there were housing societies uh, where we have various, uh, I mean, doctors and lawyers and people like even professors 
who are members of those housing societies, they informally coming together, resolving that whichever the party that agrees to spend for the compound wall, construction of the compound wall of the society, will get 72 votes of our society. So the voters are also in a mood to sell their votes, which is the the, the most, uh, I mean, uh, what I should say, I mean, the, the, something which we certainly do not want and which is going to impact on the health of our democracy. But things have come to this kind of a pass, it's a very sorry situation, because they believe that anyway, even if I don't go for selling my votes, the corporator that I'm going to elect is going to make huge money after he gets elected. And therefore, corruption again is, a, is an important factor which we need to deal with and perhaps via the electoral reforms which uh, on which again I, I would say there is a huge uh, backlog. I mean people have not applied their mind across the political spectrum and uh, this also needs to be urgently uh, looked into. If, unless we do that, things may not really throw a good politics and eventually not good policies also, I'm afraid. Okay. I'll just uh, go to Manjeet to one thing, then I'll throw it open to the audience. Manjeet, you were involved in the political uh, campaign, election campaign of certain candidates in South Bombay. Uh, would you like to share your experiences of, of, on that in, in the light of what he said, identity politics and other things, and then we'll, we'll go over to the audience. Yes, um, uh, thank you. So for all of you uh, who are thinking about volunteering for politics, I would say please do it. When you have a local election or a state election, national election, just volunteer for a month, a week, and join whichever person. It doesn't matter which party, just join in so you can understand the system. And you're absolutely right, Mr. Sasabhati. The corruption of the voter is extreme. So all of you may have, the girls are talking at the back. This is a very bad reflection of girls. <laughs> um, the voters do get paid, we all know. We, we used to have it when we used to campaign building to building. Uh, behind us would come certain political parties and slip in, in an envelope, nicely stamped, a 500 rupee note into the home, saying, Itko chodo, humko vote dena, and the soda was done. And in building election campaigns, absolutely right. They would, they would tell us, what can you do for us? We need this outer pipe fixed. If you do it, hum vote dilenge, nahi to nahi dilenge. And actually, in some sense, the voters do promise, if you give them what they want, you will get those 72 votes. So in a sense, they are more uh, reliable than the politicians who tell you that they will do things but don't do it. Uh, but the, 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 the distance between what the voters promise and what they will now not do is also narrowing. So yes, we do need to change this. Uh, and really the only, way to, uh, uh, the only way to change this is to get young people more and more involved because this is their work. One experience we had is we had a lot of young people join our campaign. And what the young do best is they have energy and they have, have a knowledge of technology. So all of you sitting at the back who are working on your phones, we had a wonderful uh, young man who used to travel with us while we were doing the campaigning from building to building. And he said, you know, we cannot compete with the big parties because they have mapped their constituencies very well. And uh, India First actually did an outstanding job. India First was a, uh, uh, an, uh, a group put together that, that helped the BJP understand the constituency and their voter, voters and what the voting pattern was, etc. Very good. But what this young man did, he was just like you, one of you young boys, he was about 19 years old. He found an app. He was a, uh, just a geek. He created an app whereby before we got to the building, he would send out a little, uh, a little message asking all the building people what their problems were. And so by the time we got to the building, it was really creative app. We knew exactly what was going on. So there's lots of little innovations taking place, but with the participation of young people. I think that has made a big difference. And uh, bringing uh, the, a new energized BJP, uh, particularly the Aadmi Party has brought a lot of young people into the fray that didn't uh, have uh, an engagement with politics before. Thanks. So uh, Sachin, you had a question and then just raise your hand, so I'll come to you. You, uh, the gentleman, the white shirt, and you, sir. So we'll go in that order. Yeah, so my question was to Dr. Sasrabhati. Uh, yeah, my, doc my question was to Dr. Sasrabhati. You spoke briefly about the, the change in the electoral system and how we can bring about change through that. 
And the second part is the power of the voter. Right, right now, I, I feel that there is, although, the, although we vote, there is no direct influence on who our candidates really are. Right? Because every party de decides who will stand for election. Unlike in the US, where there are primaries for each party, and then the, the, the registered voters decide which uh, candidate will stand for the election in the final, in the final uh, saying. Now, there might be flaws in both systems. Right? To bring about real power, in the sense that from the beginning till the end, the voter has the power to choose candidates, and finally to vote a candidate into parliament or to state legislature or the BMC, doesn't really matter. But has that power consistently. Because what has what is happening right now is that we don't really have the power to choose the candidate. Although the candidate may be, you know, dependent, I mean, uh, the choice of candidate may be dependent on caste, uh, money, um, you know, business orientation, uh, closeness and proximity to a particular political party, etc. So where, where does, uh, where do our political parties stand there? And how can, you know, how can policy wonks actually decide, you know, <coughs> come up with a system which is, not particularly, you know, have foolproof, but fairly equitable. I believe one issue is linked to the other. When we speak about the way the candidates are selected by the political parties, we need to revisit the question of the way the political parties are being run. I mean, unfortunately in our country, and perhaps India is one of the few countries where there is no definitive, comprehensive law to govern the affairs of the political parties. This is of course my personal opinion, our party may or may not have taken any position on this, but I believe it is the need of the hour that we should have a legislation governing the political parties themselves. If we have it, that if we, if we have this kind of a legislation in place, then we can influence the internal dynamics of the political parties and how need, uh, uh, how need they manage their own internal affairs and also select candidates for constituencies where, if not the voters, I'm afraid, but at least their members need to have some say. If I'm a party member, I need to have a say as to who should be the candidate from my municipal ward. Today, for example, it is not there. Forget about member of parliament and MLA, but the nearer home is my municipal councillor, and I need to have some say. But unfortunately, the present setup doesn't allow you. And when one party doesn't allow you, the other also engages into some kind of a competitive compromises and also forgets all the, those things and go the way the other parties are being done. This is a sorry state of affair. Right, because this where is what where can we have a starting point where a change can be, can be implemented? No, it is for the, as he, as somebody rightly pointed out, Madhavan said, that we need to take it, take to politics first of all. Unfortunately, today, many political parties, we have only activists who are active during the elections. In the non-election period, parties continue to be very dormant. If real citizens, I mean people like, I mean those who are here in the audience, if they take to a political party, whichever party they may be wanting to join, and they become a part of the rank and file of the political parties, they make some noises about, and they assert themselves, then I believe the things will slowly but certainly start changing. Yeah, so if I could just add to that, I, I think civil society in an organized way can influence a lot of this. So in fact, the RTI, as all of you know, is a civil society-led uh, initiative, for instance. Similarly, in uh, along with PRS, there's another first-class organization called ADR, uh, which, which has done fantastic work in making the... Uh, the political parties are a little bit more transparent and open. So you can actually get a handwritten, unfortunately, a BJP tax return from many years ago. Very sketchily returned to just comply. But regardless, at least it's now on, on publicly accessible uh, location. So I think it's, I mean, it's a tremendous call to the young people that it is possible that civil society, it has to be organized. It cannot be, you know, just doing Occupy Central in Hong Kong or uh, wherever else you do it, sort of just a negation vote. But in an organized way, there's much that is possible and much that needs to be done. So the the only comment I have on about alternatives, and I agree that first past the post system has to be re-examined in the context of India. Another interesting uh, thing that has to be re-examined is whether at the federal level, 
you have thresholds for minority parties to be present. So you say, for instance, if you don't get above six percent of the national vote, you don't show up. So Turkey, for instance, has a system like that. So there are many technical alternatives, engineering alternatives, to figure out whether or not that is what you want. But no matter what system you have, the grass will always be green on the other side. So it is better to work with the system you have and try to improve it and, and finesse it rather than keep harking after something else. And it is entirely possible by civil society and by, and by journalists essentially creating a system of influence that makes people behave a lot better. It's, it's that ambience that changes things. I mean, you can't make rules that say you have to behave properly because they will be flouted or you'll get new. <laughs> you have to create an ambience that says it is the value system of this society that you behave properly. And, and for that, every one of us has to be a part of it. No? We'll have two questions and then uh, yeah, I, 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 I must caution everybody these days about brainwashing because uh, you can see what is happening to why people join ISIS. You know, not is the media, we have been talking about uh, politicians and business and they get together and who owns the media. So uh, the thing is that uh, we have to be very careful about all this because uh, you say every vote is important. And what happens to the labor? They are also the problem. The thing is you are going to implement a thing, but the thing is how are you going to implement it? That's what's important. And then feedback from the people, all people, not only the uh, certain sections. That is not uh, there because I've heard a lot of people here in the, in the various talks. They're scared. They're scared to go on um, the net because they say if we say anything, that they, um, they're walking and everybody jumps on us. We get insulted. This sort of you, your opinion is not there. Yeah, that's. We'll come to that and we'll, we'll take this question also because we're running out of time. We can respond. Sorry, sorry. One very quick one. One very quick one. What an editor of a major newspaper I was chatting with said. To paraphrase Gandhi, an independent media is a good idea. <laughs> I won't name Professor. This is a question for Mr. Shastrabuddha. What suits India better, a two or a three party system with part, national parties, or, or the other alternative is to have coalition government with regional parties, which is uh, more conducive to India? For a healthy democracy, uh, a multi-party system is certainly important and uh, no matter how many regional parties you have, that also is not going to impact very adversely. Point is, politics is being, I mean, forming a political party has become a business. You know how many political parties are there in India? More than 1200 political parties, registered and recognized, both included. Because forming a political party is much more easier than establishing a voluntary organization. You just can enter into the election commission office, file a few papers and get out and then go and print a card saying that you are the national president of party XYZ and uh, enhance your nuisance value. So it has become a business, very unfortunately. This, yeah, this needs to be, of course, stopped in one way or the other are discouraged from stop. And therefore a lot more is required to make running a political party a serious business. Once you do that, it will naturally impact upon uh, the spurious parties that we have all around and we will have only serious parties <coughs> as against them and then perhaps politics can become a lot more serious than what it is today. I want to pick up what the gentleman mentioned about media and uh, voices being silenced. I think we are in the, in the phase where there is a real risk that uh, dissenting voices will be silenced. The, and the dissenting voices can be of any kind of thing. It could be about environment, it could be about feminism, it could be about politics. I think it's a large part of it is due to the fact that uh, we have the internet and social media where every individual is equipped to uh, respond, gang up and response, right? So the ganging up is not so much by the state. So this is, I mean, there is some amount of organized uh, silencing of opinion which happens. But online there is also a lot of unorganized silencing of opinion. It's people hunting in packs. And it's behavior of people online which is which is a problem. Uh, again, my I'm not being uh, pessimistic about this. As people learn how this media, uh, these media work, uh, I think the behavior will change. I mean, it's very difficult to keep uh, our people of our nation down and quiet. 
we don't. I mean, even the emergency lasted for only that long. Hi, my question is for uh, Ms. Kriptani, Mr. Satsugudya, and Mr. Madhavan. So I'm speaking on this issue of young people bringing change. Uh, and I'm, from my own personal experience, uh, I was one of the founders of CAG. We worked very closely with Mr. Modi uh, on his election campaign. And we were involved in bringing his message out, you know, in the most innovative way, the most creative way. Like we designed Chai Pe Cha Cha, and those hologram rallies and all those things. But my experience has been that there's a glass ceiling to how much young people can do. You know, I mean, we do all these things and then there's no way to absorb us in the system. And the issue with going the traditional route in the system is you kind of become a part of the apparatus. You don't think differently, you know, from the way the bureaucracy thinks. You don't think differently from the way the uh, politicians think. Uh, some of your thinking also gets changed. So, what has been your, uh, have you seen changes in, uh, you know, the, the kinds of things young people are able to do right now in politics, even in the traditional stream of bureaucracy, politics, and uh, the legislature? Uh, since I have not ever worked with an established political party, I can tell you that I work for an independent candidate, uh, and then one who, uh, Worked for the who stood for the Amadi Party and just I think new political parties. Can you hear me? New political parties really have brought in young people because they cannot get the established lot. The establishments have already gone to the main parties, so the young people are looking for an entry point. You're right, and they're doing it through the new parties. So a lot of the, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the uh, enthusiasm you saw for the Amadi Party came from young people because they were able to absorb them because the party was new. Uh, they didn't. Uh, they didn't really have the uh, have the roadmap ahead as the established parties. So they were looking for change. They represented change. And I think similarly for our think tanks, we're all new think tanks, and all of us have lots and lots of young people because they are over fifty percent of India. Their views are representative, so they may not be mature views. But with training and exposure to the mature views, they bring their young ideas and their young enthusiasm into the policy world. And young people believe that uh, everything is possible. So it's really uh, fantastic and uh, you will agree, although sometimes we feel like a training ground for uh, the young people, it's great to have their input because uh, they're not innovative. I believe uh, your question is very important because uh, joining a political campaign during the election is one thing and taking to politics as a vocation or as a career is, I mean, something very different. And I must say that politics time-wise and resources-wise is extremely, extremely demanding. At least that, that is what it has become. Should it be like that, that's a different story. But it has become extremely demanding. And therefore, for youngsters of your kind, of your age group, to also have a professional career and side by side do politics is increasingly becoming extremely hard. And therefore, innovative ways will have to be found out. And as has been rightly pointed out, even though I differ with the way Aam Army Party was run naturally, but the point that Aam Army Party was perhaps trying to make was that it was trying to give a message that the days of new politics have come. But unfortunately, they couldn't take it to the logical end and they couldn't uh, succeed, which is why the story remained uh, there where it was. But I believe certainly India requires a new style of politics wherein youngsters could be given a space, their voices could be heard, they could be doing politics alongside their other professional careers. For that, again, as I said, an overhaul is required. With uh, Madhavan, you can uh, have the last word because there is central note saying that the stage will fall if we don't get off. Can I? Can yeah. I just stop. No, no, no. You can okay. just. Make very, very, and very, very quick comment, quick comment yeah. on my behalf. Very quick comment to this question. Like any other business, there are different avenues. So if you're joining a job, you could join a large company. In which case, it will take you 30 years to be the top. You join a sub, you might rise faster, higher risk. So it's very similar in policy politics space. You have to make your choices and take your risks and figure out how you do. Uh, 
concluding comment on your behalf. Thank you. I, okay. The way I understand democracy, and that's basically what we are talking about when we are talking politics and policy, and whether good politics makes good policy, at least my understanding, it may be completely wrong, is that democracy is not designed to give you good policies. It is designed to prevent bad outcomes, horrible outcomes. That's what it does. So if somebody goes very bad, like Ms. Mrs. Gandhi during the emergency, she gets kicked out. So that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to avoid extreme outcomes. And that we have managed well. Thank you.